Well, I want to tell you of, uh, of something that happened during our summer vacation, uh, just this past summer. Uh, typically, uh, Yvonne and I, we, we travel out to California to see her folks in uh, Northern California. It's like the cheapest vacation that we can have because we go there, we get a uh, free room, and we pitch in with uh, the board, and um, we use their cars, and we enjoy their, their pool, and we've been doing that for 30 years of our marriage, and we've gone out there 29 of the years. The only year we didn't was when uh, Vaughn was pregnant with uh, Stephanie. Yeah, and so we didn't that year, and, uh, and, and when we go out there, the weather in California is like wonderful. It's like 80 every day and just wonderful. Sometimes it, get, it gets hotter, um, but never rains. But the, the one time we went out east for a vacation when, uh, when Ivana was pregnant with Stephanie, it rained and rained and rained and rained and rained. So we, we think we've learned our lesson to go to California. Anyway, went to California a couple of weeks, um, and then uh, we, we came home by way of Durango, uh, Colorado, where SR lives. We're dropping SR off. Are we dropping him off or seeing him? I forget. We're dropping him off. He and his wife, Jenna, dropping her, them off there. And we just spent a, a day or two in Durango before we came home. And, and while we were there, we went to church, and uh, Jenna had invited some of her family over. And one of the people that came over was her uncle, Audie. And uh, Audie is just a, a, a great man who was a, a former leader in his church, preached a lot in his church, but only recently was saved. And um, so he was telling his testimony just a few years ago. He, he was saved. And he was giving his testimony to all of us there at the lunch table after church uh, on that Sunday. And, and, and this is testimony that constantly he gives. This is elevator pitch, if you will, in some regards. He says there are three words that really made a big difference in his life. It was salvation, sanctification, and glorification. And, and he said that when he was at a, a former church, he like, was never clear on those words. Um, that, that they were distinct and that they were different. He thought that salvation and sanctification and glorification were all the same. And so the result of that is that his salvation was dependent upon his sanctification. In other words, a very works-based sort of message that, that he preached. But when he was told and, and, and came to see and understand it and believe that his salvation and sanctification were different things, it, it like opened his eyes to the realities of Christ, that he came to understand once and for all that his salvation was secured with Christ at the cross when he, he died for our sins, and, and that we simply need to believe and trust in Christ, and, and our sins are forgiven, we're made righteous, and our sanctification is the process ever be as difficult as it is and painfully slow, that our sanctification is, is, this, is this way in which we conform our, ourselves and God, God works in us to conform us to the image of Christ over the duration of our life. But doesn't, have, doesn't mean that, that we need to be sanctified in order to be saved. It's not, not that, that God has to change us to me meet this measure of, of holiness and, and standard of righteousness before we're saved. And glorification, of course, is that time when the removal of, of all sin from our, our souls are taking place. Either the, our death we stand before the presence of God, or, or whether that's in the second resurrection when Christ comes back. But, but understanding these was all, all transforming for him. To understand that salvation and sanctification and glorification were, were all separate. They're different things. Now, they're linked for sure, linked in time. And those who are saved through time and through the process of God working will be sanctified, or will sanctify continually, will We'll more and more conform to the image of Christ, and then ultimately we'll be glorified. But they are different and distinct. And this, this comes up in Scripture several times. Like Ephesians 2, 8, 9, perhaps the most simple place. For by grace you've been saved through faith. It is not your own doing. It's a gift of God, not as a result of works that no one could boast. It's the reality of the gospel. We're saved by grace through faith. We don't work for it. We don't pay for it. It's a gift. Uh, repentance is a gift of God that He gives to us. He gives us faith, opens our eyes to believe in the glories of Christ. There's nothing that we can boast in. We can't say, hey, I was so smart to believe. No, God is the one that gave you the faith. That's what it says. It's a gift of God. Faith. God saves us by His grace, so we can't boast. It's echoing the cry of the Reformers, we say we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Yet, Though we're saved by faith alone, this faith is never alone. It's really the next verse that sometimes people forget. 
Sometimes people like mess those up and connect those like, like Audie did, but it's different. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In other words, right, when God saves us by his grace, he calls us to works, right? And he calls us to labor, not, not because we have to earn anything or, or show our sincerity, but to be a witness of the transformed life that God creates in us. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. He's different, he's changed. And that will manifest itself in the good works that God prepares us for. It's a, it's a teaching of, of all of Scripture. Titus 3, 5, 4 and 5 says this, when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not on the basis of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing and regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. See, God saves us not, not because of works of what we do, but he saves us by his mercy, kindness. A few verses later, then Paul writes about this good works. He says, and let our people learn to devote themselves to good works. So ask to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. Right? Verse 14 doesn't have to do with our salvation, but has to do with what, if we're saved, if God has saved us and transformed us, right? we need to learn the ways of walking in good works. In James chapter 2, James labors long and hard to show how faith without works is dead. I'm not going to read that whole passage for you other than just to say this, faith without works is dead. Right? You, you say, okay, well, I, I, I believe, right? That's, that's well and good, right? I'm, I'm, I'm saved, right? But the, the, the faith that is there by, by grace alone is never alone. The works will follow, they'll be there, but they're not, they're not connected in terms of needing one for the other. But they are sequential, and they will be there. If you believe in Christ, your life will be changed. And you will desire good works. And you will desire to walk in the ways of God. Now, in our text this morning, I, I think these two ideas are, are good to see as we see in Psalm 149. So you can open your Bibles to Psalm 149. This is the, the fourth of the five Alleluia Psalms we've been looking at. The Alleluia Psalms are the last five Psalms in uh, the book of Psalms. Psalm 146, 147, 148, 149, and 150. They're the Alleluia Psalms because they all begin with Alleluia and they all end with Alleluia. Alleluia means praise the Lord. And you can just look at those Psalms. You can see how every one of them begins with praise the Lord. And then how they all end with praise the Lord. And, and all these call, Psalms call us to praise the Lord. Now, each in their own unique way. Psalm 146, we looked at a few weeks ago, uh, really calls us to resolve to praise the Lord. As the psalmist says in verse 1, praise the Lord, O my soul. It's as if he is, is, is pleading with his soul to praise the Lord. And so likewise, we need to have a resolve that we would praise the Lord. Really, that's the hope of my message this morning, is that we would be people who would resolve in our hearts to praise the Lord. Psalm 146 speaks about praise as fitting. It's appropriate. Verse 1, Psalm 147, praise the Lord, for it's good to sing praises to our God. It is pleasant and a song of praise is fitting. It's good. It's not a wearisome task, what I'm calling you to do, what the psalmist calls it. It's good. It's pleasant. It's fitting. It's appropriate. We who've been saved by grace, it's appropriate for us then to worship this God. And then last week, we saw, looked at Psalm 148. It's a call for all creation to praise the Lord, whether in the heavens or on the earth. All of creation is called to praise the Lord, and that's you. The heavens praise the Lord. The animals, the trees praise the Lord. Are you the only being in the universe that's not praising the Lord? That's really the call of there. Are, are we the only re rebels? Or do we join with the chorus of creation in that? Well, all, all that to say, right, are, are you giving your hearts to glorify the Lord, to praise Him? That's my heart in my messages I've been preaching, right? It's a great application of Psalms. I want us to be better praisers, right? Did you sing differently this morning because of what I've been preaching on? I know what it's like as a preacher. Maybe not. I'm trying. But let me pray now that God indeed would change us. Oh, Father, this morning I do pray as we just continue to bang this theme and pound this theme of, of praising you, of, of hallelujah. God, that you would work in us and work in our hearts. God, to give us greater reason to praise you. Maybe may even say as Psalm 146 verse 1 says, Oh, my soul, praise the Lord. Right? When, when we fail. That we're not as earnest with all of our heart as we ought to be. God, may you help us in that. Even as we sang today, you give, you take away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. That when it's hard, that, oh, my soul, praise the Lord. Because it's fitting. All creation is doing it. 
God, may we do so as well. I just would pray you'd anoint my preaching now, sink deep into the hearts of all of us. May Psalm 149 be a, a psalm that we treasure and, and cherish as we understand more and more the call to praise the Lord. Let's pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I want to read the psalm for us, Psalm 149. It's nine verses, real simple, real short. Cuts nicely in half. As I read it for you, I want you to, where, where, where is it cutting in half? Where, where's, where's that point? Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song, His praise in the assembly of the godly. Let Israel be glad in His Maker. Let the children of Zion rejoice in their King. Let them praise His name with dancing, making melody to Him with tambourine and lyre. For the Lord takes pleasure in His people. He adorns the humble with salvation. Let the godly exult in glory. Let them sing for joy on their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their throats and two-edged swords in their hands to execute vengeance on the nations and punishments on the people, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute on them the judgment written. This is the honor for all His godly ones. Praise the Lord. Maybe you saw the hinge. I'm not sure if you did. The first half of the psalm is about joy, and the, the second half of the psalm speaks about judgment. There's, there's joy and there's judgment. That is uh, the title of my message this morning. It's really the outline of this psalm, joy and judgment. Just want to show you these things. Look, look first at the, the joy is where we're going to look, and we will get to the judgment. But this is the first, right, five and a half verses, verses 1 through 6a. The judgment, right, begins in 6b through 9, and, and that's the hinge of verse 6. Uh, let the high praises of God be in their throats, there's the joy, and the two-edged swords in their hands, there's the judgment that comes later. And, and by the way, this is no accident. Oftentimes, right, we just say, well, that's, it's a bad verse marking. Right? There, there are many times where you, you have a verse, and it's like, oh, why did the verse break there? Because the verses are man-made, right, where exactly the numbers go. Um, but in this case, not so. It's, it's intentionally right there in the middle of a verse. You know, I say that because of Hebrew parallelism. Uh, oftentimes, when you say in Hebrew, you say one line, and then you say the next line, and it's either the, the same, or it's slightly different, or said in a little bit different way, and sometimes it's antithetical. And right here, it's antithetical. High praise of God, there's joy in their throats and two-edged swords in their hands. We'll get to the judgment, um, but let's look first here at the joy, because that's what jumps out for you at the, at the first five and a half verses. Uh, verse 1, praise the Lord, sing to the Lord a new song, His praise in the assembly of the godly. Now, that may not strike you as joy, but a, a new song often puts a skip in her step. Uh, it's when the godly gathers, there's often joy in the assembly of the people. Joy is also in verse 2. Let Israel be glad in his maker. Let the children of Zion rejoice in their king. Glad, rejoice. These are, are joy words expressing happiness and delight. In verse 3, we, we read of, of dancing and, and musical instruments. Let them praise his name with dancing, making melody to him with tambourine and lyre. Dancing is often an expression of joy, right? Accompanied with joy. And music often brings a smile to the face and gladness to the heart. Verse 4, even we see the joy of God taking pleasure in those who worship Him. It says in verse 4, the Lord takes pleasure in His people. He has joy when we praise. Even this morning as we sang praise to God together in the assembly, God's pleased with that. He's happy with that. There's, there's joy because He adorns the humble with salvation. Because He gives to us salvation, not to those who earn it, but to the humble. And verse 5, even we see joy again. Let the godly exult in glory. Let them sing for joy on their beds, exulting in, in glory and singing for joy, both expressions of joy and gladness. And even verse 6 begins with this command, let the high praises of God be in their throats. Lift it up, loud praises of God from the depths of, of our throat. I mean, that is the first half of our psalm, overflowing with joy. So here's a question for you, right? Are you filled with joy when you praise the Lord? God isn't calling us to have right, this, this downcast, somber um, sort of worship of Him. He wants us to be joyful. He's calling us even here to be joyful. That's how praise works. It, it comes from the heart. 
of joy to God. And then oftentimes, the worship of God produces a joy in us as well. All right, so what I want to do is I just want to dig deeper in these verses, just pounding this theme of joy, and then we'll look at judgment after that. So let's just, let's just look at verse 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. I'm just going to open them up for you, just make some observations, sort of try to press them into your heart so that you can, you can see there. Verse 1, we read again, praise the Lord, sing to the Lord a new song, His praise in the assembly of the godly. The, the setting of verse 1 is the congregation. It's the church service, if you will. It's the time when Israel gathered. It's the time when we gather. It's the assembly of the, the godly. And during that assembly here, we're exhorted to sing a new song. Now, when you read through your Bible, you encounter this phrase on a number of occasions. I think it's maybe nine times in all the Bible, this, this new song, this sheer chadesh is what it is. This chadesh is kind of like a, the, the new, the freshness, the new moon is often related to this word. It's a, it's a newness. Psalm 96 verse 1, oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Psalm 98, verse 1. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for He's done marvelous things. And the idea of this new song is that it's a fresh song. Now, we at Rock Valley Bible Church, we love singing old songs, don't we? We still have hymnals. Many churches ditch the hymnals. We keep the hymnals. And the hymnals keep us secure and rooted to the songs that have been sung for centuries. Right? And when we think about last week, we sang uh, All Creatures of Our God and King. You remember what century that was written in? Who was it written by, first of all? This is from last week, right? This is the preacher. Right? He knows that at the end of the day, only 5% of what he says, and by the end of the week, only like half of Who wrote All Creatures of Our God and King? St. Francis of Assisi. When did he li live? Uh, like 1100s, 1200s, right? So 13th century. So we sing that song. That's an old song that's sung for centuries, and our hymnal is filled with songs that are centuries old. That's why we sing... From him. And there's, there's no reason why not to sing old songs. Israel did that. My, my reading through the, through the Scriptures this year was really, really struck by when Solomon dedicated the temple in 2 Chronicles chapter 5. It, it says, it's a, His loving kindness is everlasting. And, and that's, like, that's like of any phrase, of any chorus Israel sang, they sang that over and over and over again. His loving kindness is is everlasting. That was sung in Josiah's time, and, and even then, when the new temple was made in Ezra, I forget what it is, Ezra 7, when it was dedicated, I, I forget, Ezra 6 maybe, that was the first words that came out of their mouth when they made the second temple. His loving kindness is everlasting, tying the message of, of God and His truth. The same song that was sung at the first temple was sung at the second temple. They, they sang old songs, but here the command is to sing a new song. And Ryan had us all sing new songs today. How many of the songs do you know? Do you know most of them? Some of them you didn't. They were new. The idea, I think, Ryan, was to sing a lot of new songs. So some of the new songs are old songs. My guess is, I'm not exactly sure, all those songs were less than 20 years old. No? Blessed Be Your Name is kind of the oldest. 2,000. Okay, what about the other ones? All in this millennium. How's that? They're all less than 22 years old. And, and many of them were like 2012, even. What, what's the latest one? You're like, you, you know that. 2018? Okay, four years old. That's a new song. Nobody in the history of the church ever sang that song until four years ago. That's a new song. And we're commanded here to sing new songs because with new songs comes a freshness. New songs often flow from new experiences of mercy and grace. Think about, the, the, listen to the context of Psalm 40. Verse 1 through 3, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and hear my cry. So here's David. He's, he's in trouble. He's crying out to the Lord. He's waiting patiently. And God heard his cry. Verse 2, Psalm 40, verse 2, He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry blog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. So having been rescued and having been redeemed, there's a new song that, that comes from a new experience of mercy and grace. As David recalls his troubles, and we cried out to the Lord and God answered him. And that's when a new song is put in his mouth. It's a, it's a fresh deliverance. It's a, it's a fresh experience of mercy and grace that brings a new song. I love what David Mathis says about this. He says this. He says, new songs of praise are appropriate for new rescues and fresh manifestations of grace. He said, as long as God is gracious toward us and as long as He keeps showing us His power and wowing us with His works, it's fitting that we not just sing old songs inspired by His past grace, 
but also that we sing new songs about His ever-streaming, never-ceasing grace. That's a new song. Fresh experience of mercy and grace, responding in the heart of even people today, singing with, with new words and new melodies up to the Lord. And I trust that you see the joy in that. I mean, people aren't normally writing songs out of just, um, man, I hate doing this. I don't want to do this. i got to write this song. But there, there's something has happened. And they respond with joy and write some expression of that. And I think that's the key to understanding Revelation 5. When, when the Lamb breaks open the seal and, and the inauguration of His kingdom is coming, Revelation 5 says those in heaven, right, the elders and the four living creatures, they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain. And by your blood you ransomed people from, for God from every tribe and language and tongue and people and nation. And you've made... From them. You've made them a kingdom of priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. It's like a new song that's sung in heaven. It's old for us because it's 2,000 years old, but there's this, this freshness and newness in heaven. They sang this new song. It's a, it's, a, it's a great joy in heaven when Jesus began to establish His reign upon the earth, and it called for a new song. Well, that's verse 1, the joy of the new song. Well, let's just open up two, verse 2 for you. Let Israel be glad in His Maker. Let the children of Zion rejoice. Now, we often think about joy as a feeling that just comes when some fortuitous circumstances come our way. Um, say when our favorite team wins the game, and the Bears won the preseason game yesterday against the Chiefs. <laughs> rah, rah. Um, I have some close friends who are Chiefs fans, and I will text him about that. The Bears, it's only preseason, though, <laughs> when it comes to regular season. It's going to be different, but there's a joy that comes, right? That's trivial, frivolous sort of joy, but a, a, a deeper joy might be when a child is born to us, or a grandchild that we've known the experience of. Now there's a, a great joy with that. Courtney and Andy, when your child comes, I hope I don't see you next week <laughs> because your child comes, right? The joy that comes from that. There are deep joys, and, and joys might be whatever, on whatever level, right? You receive a good grade in school, there's a joy, Right? Or, or you pass some sort of certification exam, which, which involves right, a raise at work or an advancement. Or you're on vacation, right? enjoying the, the rest and relaxation that that provides. But that's often what we think about when joy comes, like just responding to, to good things. But verse 2 is a command to praise the Lord. Not because of any earthly event that brings joy into our hearts, but because of God is. And because of what He has done and who He's always been. Right? Let the Israel be glad in his maker, right? Rejoice that he's the creator and we're the created. Let the children of Zion rejoice in their king, that he is our Lord who rules and reigns over us, that he's a good Lord. He's a kind Lord. There's reason to rejoice. And, 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 and the command to be joyful comes often in the Bible. Psalm 100, verse 1, make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into His presence with singing. We're, we're supposed to. God commands us when we come into His presence with gladness, with joy. We are commanded to worship the Lord and to sing with joy in our hearts. Psalm 33, verse 1. Shout for joy in the Lord. You, His righteous, praise befits the upright. And, and there are dozens of other commands like this that when we worship the Lord, we're commanded to do so with joy. Not unlike the New Testament, Paul says, Philippians 4, 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Whether it's good times or bad times. It's Job, right? God gives, God takes away. But I'm going to rejoice because I'm commanded to do that and I'm going to find my joy in the Lord. I'm going to, blessed be the name of the Lord. Or Paul, as he's contemplating even his own life, whether to, to live as Christ, to die as gain, that he... He wants to die, but he knows to be here, and he's struggling with life and death, but through it all, he says, regardless, let's rejoice in the Lord always. We're commanded to be joyful people, not glib for no reason, but deeply joyful in the Lord. He's our creator and our king. He's called us into his kingdom by his grace, and there's great reason to be joyful. And listen, for those who have experienced the grace of God and salvation, the gospel is especially true. He's taken us in our sin, transformed us from the kingdom of darkness into his marvelous light, forgiving us all of our iniquity, transgression, and sin, adopting us into His family so we'll experience Him forever, the pleasures that are ever there, the presence of the Lord, Psalm 16, 11. And that should stir us, not earthly circumstances, but the Lord. He's our maker. He's our king. There's joy. Well, verse 
3 speaks about how this should impact us and change us. Let them praise His name with dancing, making melody with Him with tambourine and lyre. Now, dancing comes up here, and throughout the history of the Christian church, there have always been these bah humbug, Ebenezer Scrooge sort of preachers who will oppose dancing, thinking dancing is of the devil. Now, it's difficult to ban a practice which is done in light of verse 3, which actually commands us to dance. Now, to be fair, there is a dance that is all sensual and stirs up sexual desires. It's wicked and ought to be avoided. I'm thinking of the dance that um, the daughter of Herodias danced before the company of Herod at his party. Right? Probably drunken, probably right, committing adultery in their heart, probably, you know, I'll give you half my kingdom sort of response from that. That's probably... Wicked. I'm thinking of the seductive pole dancer. I'm, I'm thinking of the teenage mosh pit where bodies are, bodies are rubbing together and frolicking. Like, you know what? That's, that's of the devil. But there is a, a dance that is motivated and desired by joy in God, which is thoroughly sanctified and thoroughly a wonderful thing. I'm thinking about the dance that King David was so excited the ark came into Jerusalem. Right? Here was the first time in, in history the ark was actually going to come in to God's resting place where God was going to dwell right there on, on Mount Moriah. He, he dreamed of that day when it would take place. And, and three months before, the, he was excited, but it was delayed because Uzzah held, right, when, when the cart or the oxen stumbled, he put out his hand to try to steady the ark. And as uh, R.C. Sproul says, he thought his hand was cleaner than the dirt. But God had said, no one can touch my ark. And so right there, Uzzah was struck dead, and the ark stayed in the house of Obed-Eden for three months. But finally, the day has come, and when the time was right, David was so thrilled that he was just stirred to dance and praise before God. 2 Samuel 6, so David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Eden to the city of David with rejoicing. And there's his joy in his dancing. When those who bore the ark of God had gone six steps, he sacrificed an ox and a fattened animal, and David danced before the Lord with all his might. David was wearing a linen ephod, and so David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the horn. Now, as the, the story continues, Micah, David's wife, didn't appreciate David's actions. I don't know exactly why, whether her heart wasn't with the Lord, whether it has something to do with his ephod, whether he's exposing himself. We don't know. But I just say this, don't despise people when they're moved by God to praise the Lord out of response with their body. It's okay to dance. It's okay to lift your hands in song. It's okay to stir your hearts and pray, especially when it genuinely moves you. You know, just, just singing, blessed be your name, right? Your tears, your joy, or your hands go up, or your body moves in, in relation to what you're singing. Totally appropriate. And, and I know you've probably seen this before. You put some big worship band, and it pro often happens, right? The bigger the crowd, often it, it happens. There's more anonymity in the crowd. There's more performance up front. But we, we saw it this week. We Dropped Stephanie off at Louisville, Kentucky at Boyce College. Um, she's going to write up something for the Weekly Word once she gets settled here a little bit. You'll see how it is. Super impressed with that college there. Say, so send your kids there. It would be a wonderful, wonderful place. Affordable, great. But we had a, a time of worship with the students and the, and the parents who were there. And the, I'll tell you, the bass player was into it. I was wishing Hannah was in, into it like this guy was. Like, like most often, right, they're not singing. And this guy was singing, and he was, he was pumped. And I'm like, you know what? He's dancing before the Lord. This is Psalm 149. And we at Rock Valley Bible Church can be better at this. I can be better at this to be more moved. I, I just, let it be authentic, right? Let it not be a show. There's many times where it's just a show. You're just you're showing before everybody. But, let, but if it's authentic, like, let's never despise that. Let's be that. Moved, stirred with joy before the Lord. And then we have dancing, and then we have music, <clears throat> making melody him with tambourine and lyre. Tambourine's a, more of a, a percussion instrument. Lyre here is a, a stringed instrument. We're going to talk about more of these instruments next week. Uh, we look at Psalm 1, 150, which is the next one over. And here we see a bunch, bunch of instruments, trumpets and harps and strings and pipes and cymbals, uh, which, by the way, if you missed the weekly word, um, next week we're going to have an all-instrument choir. Ryan, you asked for some time. You want to just take your two minutes, right? You can come up here if you want, or you can stay right there, depending on the level of whatever. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Just a little infomercial for next week, which is going to be interesting, but it catches the theme of Psalm 150.
any kind of instrument in your house, please bring it next week, and we're going to play. Um, we're going to play some music. So we have uh, some sheet music out back. We're gonna, it's literally five notes that you're going to play. So if you are less than um, uh, proficient on your instrument, that's okay. It's five notes. They'll be pretty comfortable notes. Um, like I was, I have not played the trombone. In Yeah, you are. You are. Okay? If you play a D flat instrument, they're back there. All of the sheet music that you need should be back there. If you don't see something, talk to me. If you have questions, talk to me. But just bring whatever you can play. If you play tambourine, just bring it. We'll shake it out, you know? Like, just, <laughs> it'll, be, it'll be really fun. I'm excited. So, um, yeah, questions, talk to me. Grab the sheet music. If we run out, I can make more copies. So, thank okay. You. Thank you. Infomercial by yeah. Ryan Brown. We're going to do that. And, uh, Ryan, I don't think you know this, but when I was about yay high in junior high, I played the baritone. I have one. You have? No, I have one. I have one. I've not played it for... In our home, when they grab the baritone and they play it, they go, and baritone equals funny is really what it is. But I might, I'll try to pull that out. So, um, Dirk, maybe you've made some kind of instrument, some tambourine or drum. I'm not sure. You, you, I don't know. Whatever. It's... It'll be interesting, and I was confused by everything you say. I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'm going to try the baritone, see if I can get the valves working and stuff like that. It's been pretty pressing. Anyway, we'll talk more about instruments next week when it speaks about the, the tambourine and the lyre. Um, but verse 4 tells us that in all of this, the Lord takes pleasure in His people. He adorns the humble with salvation, verse 4. The Lord loves us. Can you imagine? He takes pleasure in us. He loves to hear our praise. And He loves to give salvation to the humble. So here is the gospel, right? God takes pleasure in His people. He delights to give them salvation. But notice here who it is who receives their salvation. It's the humble. And the humble, another word for that might be the afflicted. Those who come to the end of themselves and simply say, God, I, I got nothing and, and I need your help. I need your grace. I need your mercy. I need your forgiveness. Would you, would you save me? looking to the cross, trusting in Him alone. Those are the ones who receive salvation. Not strong in yourselves, but a crushed and in need of help. And of all the verses that have impacted me in this series, it is Psalm 146, verse 5, Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord. Right? We are blessed when God is the one who helps us. So the afflicted who say, I got nothing. God, I, I need your help. I need your deliverance. And when he comes and provides us with salvation, God delights in that. In fact, he adorns us with salvation as he makes us pretty in Jesus. It's a picture of the gospel that we who are sinners are, are dirty and yet, yet we're covered in the righteousness of Christ so that we who are sin are, are seen by God as though we were Jesus himself. Our faith comes down to us as righteousness imputed to us. He makes us beautiful. The covering of Christ, and that ought to give us great joy. Well, verse 5 continues on, let the godly exalt in glory and let them sing for joy on their beds. Verse 5 brings us into the everyday. Verse 1 brought us into the assembly, 
and now we're brought into our homes. Indeed, we're brought into our bedrooms. So picture yourself on your bed at the end of the day, just lying prone, horizontal, exhausted, in need of the daily renewal that, that sleep provides, and in that place, God calls you to praise. Just, just think of the contrast. In the assembly, there's lots of people. In your bed, there's just but one. In the assembly, it's loud, filled with activity. In your bed, it's quiet and restful and dark. In the assembly, right, you're upright and alert, but in your bed, you're prone and peaceful. And, and God wants your praise on the bed. He wants for you to sing for joy on the bed when you have nothing else to do but, but shut your eyes and then enter into another world, right, your dreamland, wherever you're going, right, just to to praise the Lord at that time. And, and I do think, right, the contrast of the assembly to the bed, like everything in between. It's not like those are the only places. He wants you in your home at your dinner table. He wants you at work wherever you are. He wants you in the car. He wants you every place to give praise to God, sing for joy. Do you do this? Are, are you joyful? It's my first point this morning. Are you joyful? Do you have joy in worshiping the Lord? That's, that's what God calls us to do. Now we come to verse 6. The hinge of the psalm, it's really it's a great summary of the psalm. If you're looking to just write a one-sentence summary of what this psalm is about, you can do no better than verse 6. Let the high praises of God be in their throats and two-edged swords in their hands. Let the high praise of God be in their throats and two-edged swords in their hands. Because we're going to talk 6b and following now about the two-edged swords in their hand. The first half calls us to praise God even with high praises, joyful praises. It's coming deep from our throats. Right? There's a big bellowing of praise unto God. And the second half summarizes the, of this verse, summarizes the second half of the psalm. It's a call to arms. It's a call to take up a sword and fight against enemies, executing vengeance, bringing punishment, taking authorities into captivity, and achieving judgment. In fact, that's why you get my, my verse here, verse 9, to execute on them judgment that is written. Now, obviously, and I hope it's obvious, um, this doesn't apply directly to us. Uh, as believers in Jesus, we're not called to take up arms and fight for the kingdom of God, taking vengeance into our own hands. The weapons of our warfare are different. As, as the, the hymn writer writes, and lead on, O King Eternal, the day of march has come. Henceforth in fields of conquest, thy tent shall be our home. For not with swords loud clashing, nor roll of stirring drums, but with deeds of love and mercy, the heavenly kingdom comes. In, in our day and age, right, the kingdom of God, of God is, is fought with a, a warfare of, of deeds of love and mercy, not with swords and spears and clubs. And, and the reason so is because what Jesus said. You remember when he was standing before Pilate and he talked about the nature of his kingdom? Pilate was there kind of wondering, oh, you are a king. Where's your kingdom? Looks like you're all alone. Are you a king with no, no subjects? What is this? And Jesus said, John 18, verse 36, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would be fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from this world. And so because the kingdom of Christ is not from this world, we don't need to take up weapons of warfare. We don't need to take the law into our own hands. We don't need to punish those who go against the law by ourselves. In our day, God has given that role to the government. Romans 13.1 says, There's no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Uh, our government's been instituted by God. Right? And you, you may not like what they're doing, or they're good a job with what they're doing. That, that's fine. But God has given them the role. Of, he's given them the sword to enforce the law. He's given them the sword to punish transgressors. Our role isn't to do their job for them. We give that to them. Our role is to support our government doing that and whatever lawful means we can to help the government in that cause. See, we're not a theocracy. The church rules society. It's not the case. God is not the President of the United States. He's deferred that authority to government and to police officers. That's Armin's job, right? It's not our job. It's his job as a representative from the government to, to do that as a policeman. But, but here's the point. When Psalm 149 was written, it was a theocracy. And God was the king on the throne. And he was calling his citizens to do the things mentioned in verses 6 through 9. He was calling them to take a sword in their hand. 
He was calling them to execute vengeance on nations and punishment on the peoples. He was calling them to so conquer that they might bind up the kings with chains and the nobles with fetters of iron and and place them in the prison. Israel was to execute judgment on them that was written. It was right for them to do so. It was the honorable thing for them to do so. In fact, that's what verse 9 says. This is honor for all His godly ones. It was an honorable thing for Israel to fight for their nation. Now, particularly, right, this took place a couple times in the Scripture. Right? I mean, particularly, think about the promise to Abraham, I'm going to give you this land. And then went Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, and then had all the people of Israel. And then he raised up Moses to come and bring the people into the land. He only got to see the land that God promised, but then it was Joshua who's going to go and take that land that God had promised. And so Joshua was leading the people into the land. God instructed them to take the land drive out the inhabitants of the land, every last one of them, and take possession of the land and live there for themselves. That's what God had told him to do. Now, and I just say, don't back off of that. I mean, I said, well, how could God do that? Well, this is God's people that He promised to give them a land. And as He went into the nation of of Canaan, they they were rebellious. They They were not worshiping the Lord. They were worshiping their own gods. They refused to submit to the Lord. And in those days, because Israel had their king, the Lord, it was a theocracy And they took the land with swords and spears. The people weren't willing to leave. They put up their fight, and they were to destroy them entirely. I I think another time was uh, uh, when uh, when Nehemiah came back and built the wall. Um, You remember, he was there, and they were building the wall. Do you remember what they had in their hands? They had a, a trowel in one hand that was building the wall, and they had a sword in their other as they took and they fought against people. And even from Zephaniah 3, it just, just speaks about just that conquering, how God's going to conquer. He's going to take away your enemies. There's going to be the judgment there taking place. That was, that was in coming into the land. That's why many people think that these psalms were written at that time, or the, the second coming back in land after the time of exile. But I think a perfect picture of this is Jericho. Because there you combine the, the joy of, of praise in God and the judgment that was executed we see the people of Israel praising the Lord as they marched around the city for six days. And on that seventh day, the priests were blowing their trumpets with armed men in front of the ark of the Lord. And after seven times around the city, Joshua said, shout, for the Lord has given you this city, right? Just shouting for joy, right? Shouting in worship and praise to God. And indeed, the high praise of God were in their throats and the two-edged swords were in their hands. And when the wall fell down, they destroyed everyone in the city, save Rahab and her family. So the psalm would have been totally appropriate for Israel to hear, taking the two-edged sword in your hands, executing vengeance on the nations, bringing punishment to the people, binding kings and putting nobles in iron, executing the judgment that Moses wrote about, an honorable thing to do as God was giving them the land through their hands. Now, we're not called to that, but you just say, okay, what's an appropriate application of that? Now, you could apply that to spiritual warfare for sure, Ephesians 6 speaks about the spiritual warfare, take up the armor of God, the shield of faith, and you can, you can do that, and certainly that is appropriate. But I think there are many other ways, and I, I simply want to say this. I just want to say an application of this is God calls us to action. All right, we, our praise of God needs to be beyond our lips, beyond just simple joy, beyond our hearts. That's what God was calling Israel to do. Is to praise God with your mouth, yes, but have a sword in your hand and ready to act and follow up as well, right? Verse 6, again, is the hinge, right? Let the high praise of God be in their throats and two-edged swords in their hands. For us, we might say it this way, let the high praise of God be in their throats and willing hands to do His work. I think that's a great application just even from this text. Remember from the beginning of my message, I quoted from from James chapter 2, verse 26, faith apart from works is dead. And how, how our salvation is different than our sanctification. But they, they do go together, right? Those, those who are saved will be transformed, right? And how are they transformed? They're transformed by doing the works that God has called us to do. We're His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that God prepared beforehand that people should walk in them. So maybe it's not fighting against enemies. Maybe the works are more from a servant perspective. After all, that's what our king did, Jesus. He came and He served. He helped. He supported even Paul will say in Acts 20, which we'll get to in a couple of weeks, he said, um, 
the Lord Jesus says, more blessed to give than to receive, right? Helping the weak, helping those who are afflicted, those that God ordain or adorns with salvation in verse 4. So we're called to work. We're called to action. Not, 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 again, not that this working is at all um, earning salvation at all, but it is the natural consequence. It is what, what they're called to do here. They're called to give joy and joyous worship to God, and the call here also is then to take up the sword and execute the judgment for Israel. I think that's the application of, of our text. And I think what's so interesting about this, this is the motto of our church, right, which is on the wall out there, which we mention often at Rock Valley Bible Church, right? We exist to what? Enjoy His grace and to extend His glory, right? Enjoying His grace. That's verse one. That's uh, my first point here, right? Enjoying the grace of God, having the joy in there of the grace of God. He's worthy to be worshiped, right? But after we worship the Lord, what do we do? We extend His glory. That's where you put shoe leather to your faith. That's where you seek all that you can do to extend the glory of God by, by good works and by serving others, not only here in the church, serving the saints in the church, but also, right, by, by even speaking with those outside the church, demonstrating what it means to be a, a genuine believer in Christ outside the church, being a witness for Christ, maybe putting feet to it and, and work and effort to it. I, I put in the weekly word there about uh, Bob Clinton doing the work in Nepal, and it's just kind of this, this work begun in this little village. He got off. He, uh, Bob Clinton often does this, right? If, how many of you read that story? I trust that many of you did. The story of just a, a crippled girl. He, he, often, he often sees, he goes, he sees these people in need and has compassion on them and cries for them and, and takes them and helps them and just provides with a couple hundred dollars, right? Some medical care that's far beyond their reach. They get some medical care of some type. And then they can just continue to go and continue to uh, show love to communities whether it was uh, during a big landslide, I remember a big earthquake <clears throat> in Nepal. They, they, you know, lots of people destroyed their home. Where homes were destroyed, and the government didn't even do anything, but Christians came in and they did something and made a big impact on communities there. And, and would that we as well would, would be about laboring and working, right? Just doing Christian deeds of good, good works that God has prepared for us to see the impact on the kingdom that that might might make. And so we enjoy the grace of God, right? That, that comes, our salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. There's nothing we do. But, but with that and how He's transformed us, we go and then we extend the glory of God by, by laboring and working and, and going to action. I think that's what Psalm 149 calls us to. That, that's where I get an application. You might get something else out of here, but certainly by praying, spiritual warfare for sure. But yet I think it can be broader than that. I think just they were called to action. We ought to be called to action and move as well. So if you just come to church and sing your song and then leave, not engaged in Christian battle at all, I just say, you know, Psalm 149 is a calling you to engage in something, volunteer for something. Work for, your neighbors are next door. Your unsaved neighbors are, are, are there. Find something which you can spread your Christian influence beyond just coming on Sunday morning. Right? But engage and work and be active and do what you can. All for the glory of God because He's changed us. We're new creatures prepared for good works that God prepared before and that we should walk in them. So let's pray. Oh, Father, I would pray that, that we might just take the message of this psalm, which combines joy um, with this call to arms, this call to action. Um, Father, may we as well be, be those at church really embrace what our, our motto is, that we would enjoy your grace and we would extend your glory. So, Lord, I, I, just, I just would pray, even as we've learning about uh, enjoying His grace and different worship, and as we worship with many instruments next Sunday, and as we sing hallelujah and, and praise the Lord, I pray that it might not just be with our mouths, but might get to our hands and our feet as we, we're about making the phone call, and we're about writing the note, and we're about visiting people in their distress, and we're about reaching out to our neighbors, and we're about letting our light shine before men. They might see our good deeds and glorify our Father who is in heaven, and providing financially when people are in struggle or providing a, a meal when people are in need. And we rejoice with those who rejoice and we weep with those who weep and give us an idea how we can do that with one another. Right? The, the command of Scripture is to love one another, serve one another, right? be kind to one another, be tender-hearted towards one another, and may we be those things, O oh Lord. Again, not for salvation, but because they, they flow from that 
and the evidence of our, our love for you. That's maybe a, we be a, a church that, that acts, that pursues, pursues good works, that presses on. It's your power that will do that. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.